Welcome to the Morales channel. My name is Sam. Today we're going to look at Web3 for game designers. So what is Web3? Web3 is the next version of the internet powered by blockchain technology. Some of the key characteristics of Web3 are that it is decentralized. This means that no single company or entity holds the data exclusively. That data is transparent, put out there into an ecosystem where owners of the data control how that data can be used. And lastly, the transactions are immutable. This means that a user playing a game, holding an NFT item, holds that forever. When we talk about Web3 gaming, we're talking about gaming built on top of that same technology. Here, players own their own participation in this open data ecosystem, and those transactions are permanent. This allows for a fundamental change in gameplay. Instead of paying to play, users can now play to earn. When designing your next project, remember that Morales gives everyone easy access to Web3 and Web3 Gaming. Check out Morales.io to learn more. Let's compare the generations of internet technology. We're currently departing Web2, and we're seeing many Web3 experiences. Technologies like Morales in the platform layer help to wrap all of the complexity of the protocol layer and allow us to build on top. Those applications that we build are the individual games like CryptoKitties, exchanges like OpenSea for NFTs, and Uniswap for trading currencies. Now it's not a perfect analogy, but let's take a look at the generation in games as compared to what we saw with Web 2 and Web 3. We're currently seeing a lot of social and multiplayer experiences, and as Web 3 expands, we're seeing more applications and games built on top. A middleware such as Unity provides the game engine and Morales helps us connect those games into the blockchain and Web3. So through that lens, we see that Morales and game engines like Unity allow us to create Web3 gaming that is practical, powerful, and profitable. Web3 is attracting top talent to create games released with Web3. The growth of Web3 gaming, as the industry continues to grow, we're seeing a lot of new companies come in and own that market. Now, thanks to the unique benefits and opportunities of Web3, we see that the approach we take to game design is unique as well. Video games and the video game development process is complex. As teams and budgets expand, there's all sorts of disciplines that are needed on a team to create a successful title. And we see that the game design process as well continues to evolve to embrace new technology and new trends in users' expectations. The process of game design varies from team to team, but some of the hallmark stages the teams will go through include planning the game out. This is a great place to start when you're considering what the game is, how the user is going to interact, etc. Throughout pre-production, there's prototyping done, experimentation on what the world will look like, creation of original assets, bringing on the team and onboarding them into the process as well. Production is where we typically think of the bulk of the steps, but it's important to know that that's just one stage in this larger process. Here, the actual game development is laid down, final code begins to be inputted, as well as the final assets. Teams continue on to test and iterate on development. Also, there's a pre-launch step where that project gets close enough to be maybe beta released out, especially with larger and more complex projects. You want to do network tests to make sure that connected users around the world are able to play your game faithfully. Then the game launches, of course. There was a time in history when launching the game was saying goodbye to it and all your system and team resources went on to something new. However, with today's games, the expectation of the changes and the evolution of a game post-launch, it's an entire other process in itself. The game will continue to be live, get changed, go through some or all of these steps again, and be relaunched with an update to the users. Games live for years. The games that take the best advantage of Web3 include planning for that Web3 experience. Web3 also will impact each stage of development here, but a special emphasis on planning and starting early so that those Web3 concepts can be ever present in the user's experience in that game. Well-made software is user-centric. Now, well-made games search out that joy and focus on the player experience, embracing the fun factor. Here we're seeing Bartle's taxonomy of players. These are some common player personas that may visit your game experience. 
In social and multiplayer, we particularly think of their relationship with how they act in the world, how they're interacting with other players. For example, an achiever moves through the world and likes to hit different benchmarks and receive awards and achievements for their progress through the game. Whereas an explorer is more about interacting in that world and uncovering the world regardless of receiving that same level of feedback. And in free-to-play gaming, it's important to look at the microtransactions and how users respond. The largest portion of your player base will be what are called minnows. They participate in the game, of course, in all aspects, but may never make a financial transaction to buy in-game currency or items. There's dolphins and then whales who are going to spend much more. Now, a game can't focus on any one of these because they're all important in the symbiotic relationship. For example, whales make big purchases so they can be seen in their cosmetic benefits and outfits through the lens of the other users who are around them. Now let's look at the Web3 player types. This is an evolving space, but here's one way to look at it. Instead of just having players as we've seen in other paradigms, we also have earners who might be working in that game world mostly motivated by finance and earning instead of just playing for joy. Then we have investors as well, including crypto whales whose purchases and sales of cryptocurrency underneath your game might help and hurt that economy. It's important to think of each of these types together so that your game at least addresses their needs or chooses not to. In summary, as you think about your player types, choose which ones you want to target. What makes them unique? What are their motivations and which assets are they going to be interacting with? And how do you retain them long term? You may be familiar with the term core game loop, which is just one of these series of repeating actions that the players will go through. There are several other loops that I'd like to focus on. In its simplest form, we have action, reward, and expansion. Let's think of a classic game like Pac-Man. The user inputs the direction they're going to move, that's the action. The reward is picking up points as they go along, occasionally getting those power pellets, which are the special ones that give them temporary invulnerability, expanding their abilities as a player. When we think about game design loops, each has an opportunity and focus on different aspects of the player experience. The game engine's render loop renders often in milliseconds. This is more important for developers to think of than designers, but I wanted to include it here. There's an opportunity to create smoothness and responsiveness in your game at this level. Often this is transparent to the player, and frankly, you want it to be. The gameplay loop focuses on the actions of the player. The time frame here is just seconds, and the player is thinking mostly about a fun experience. If they're playing something like Candy Crush, they might think to themselves, I click matching colors. In this context, that's all they really care about. The core loop is the heartbeat of the game and introduces rules. From this context, the player may think about their own activities and say, I click matching colors to clear the board within the time limit. The meta loop establishes and maintains the long-term vision and engages the player over that long period of time. It gives context to the player on why their actions matter. A player thinking from this perspective, whether they're aware of it or not, might say to themselves, I click those colors, I clear the board within the time limit, and they do that to earn enough gold to build up my character to eventually save that princess. It's important to think about Web3 in each of these loops, but particularly in the meta, there's a lot of opportunities, including the progression of the character, the economy, how those NFTs affect the marketplace, leaderboards, social aspects. There's a lot of opportunities here. In the traditional gaming approach, in its simplest form, that loop could be action, reward, and expansion. With Web3, we have a critical change in the loop. After the reward phase, the user can interact with the blockchain. This vastly expands what they're able to do as a player, an earner, or an investor. They can buy and sell things they earned in the in-game. They can trade those items with others. They're also able to explore governance, perhaps earning or accruing or buying into the ability to vote on which world opens up next in a open world game. Now imagine thousands of concurrent users, each exploring their own game loop and periodically interacting with that blockchain together. They're making purposeful choices to further their own game development and build out that ecosystem. Now, in addition to that player marketplace, we could expand it even further. 
If that universe or game ecosystem has automated market makers, these are algorithms that are out there running and assisting new types of operations, borrowing and lending items to the players, adding liquidity in the world to give a more fast and responsive experience to people who are playing, or doing much, much more on top of that. The vast new opportunities of Web3 bring additional complexity. And it's an evolving challenge for us as game designers to figure out how best to balance that ecosystem across all those user types and all these game loops. Some of the balance tactics that you can use are controlling the power and delivery of your items. Let's say, for example, that finishing a quest gives you the upgrade to your sword. Thinking about a 10% boost in the abilities is good enough for the user to be excited about it, but it's not so overpowered that it messes with the balance of the game. Also, instead of explicitly showing that 10% in the item lookup or details, being opaque about it, hiding that detail until the point of reward, allows you to fluctuate it from a 9% bonus to an 11% bonus if that helps balance your game out later. The delivery can be controlled as well. For example, instead of explicitly winning a sword, maybe after the quest the user has the ability or the chance to win the sword. That chance percentage could be fluctuated as well, as well as offering a timer. Perhaps there's a chest that opens, but only after 10 minutes or 10 days of gameplay. That time delay can be fluctuated as well. All these tactics together will help you expand your game universe while maintaining balance. As the Web3 game industry evolves, we see varying levels of adoption. The game industry has responded in some cases with a resounding yes, in others a cautious no, and some game teams sit somewhere in between. On the yes side, we see countless new game teams launching projects every day in Web3, taking advantage of the technology. We see AAA veterans like the Epic Game Store embracing new technology like Web3, NFTs, and blockchain technology. And we also see other veterans like the Valve Steam Marketplace saying no so far to any blockchain-based games. And some companies are partially embracing the technology. Ubisoft, a well-known game development company, is embracing a new technology they call Ubisoft Quartz. This is something like an NFT trading marketplace, but with limitations. Now, why would a game team partially embrace Web3 technology? Let's take a look at the different types of universes that can be created. In its simplest form, a traditional game is separate and isolated. Now that same game could be part of a larger universe. Using the decentralized marketplace, things like Uniswap and OpenSea for exchange of currencies and NFTs could help augment that game and expand the boundaries of play sessions. With Ubisoft's Quartz project, we see a closed ecosystem. There are games that are in a expanding universe, but those games connect only with a centralized marketplace that is owned with particular proprietary rules by Ubisoft. So the Ubisoft solution does not embrace the best parts of Web3. Let's take a look. Per decentralization, Ubisoft is running its private blockchain that is less connected to the larger ecosystem. From a transparency standpoint, the data is not freely open for third parties to interact with. And from an immutability standpoint, the NFT items, which Ubisoft calls digits, come with many restrictions. There's a restriction on the player's age who's able to own and earn these items. There's a restriction on the player's nationality, player rank in the game, the number of items they can hold, and more. So from that perspective, I consider Ubisoft's Quartz project a partial embrace of Web3 technology. Every time you think Web3, think Morales. Morales provides a single workflow for building high-performance dApps. It's going to be able to help us in applications and in games. The Morales workflow has everything that you need to get going. It handles the identity of your users, login, etc. It handles the real-time side of pulling data synced from the blockchain for use in your app. There's the Morales SDKs, which are important for us as game developers. We're able to work inside the environment that we're most familiar with. Unity as a developer for me, and different platforms for others. And for power users, you're able to get at the Morales API, which gives you the limitless flexibility that you need to build on top. 
Morales replaces the cost and complexity of managing your own in-house infrastructure. For example, using Morales, you can handle user authentication with one line of code. And of powerful importance, Morales is cross-chain and cross-platform. As game developers, we have choice of where we want to build. And with full gaming support, you're able to use the Morales SDK inside of Unity for new projects and existing projects as well. Download the Morales Metaverse SDK today. The link is in the description. Now you can level up your Web3 development skills by building weekly projects. With morales.io slash projects, you'll be able to build weekly projects, often launched on the weekends, win NFTs for your participation. Now, if this type of web content is exciting for you, like and subscribe to videos so you won't miss out on other free content in the future. In summary, we've seen with the benefits and opportunities of Web3, we need unique game design as well. We've looked at the players and how to target them, different loops and how that affects our decisions as game designers, and also take a look at some of the challenges, particularly with balance and adoption. What Web3 game will you create next? We'd love to hear from you in the comments. Thanks.